Good morning, friends from Hudson Wesleyan Church. I want to welcome you into this virtual worship service. I appreciate you joining us here. And again, a little bit of a different way. We've certainly done these uh, plenty of times over the last couple of years. And thankfully, um, this winter, we've been able to uh, mostly be meeting in person. But uh, for today, uh, we are just doing a virtual worship service, and I'm glad that you have been able to tune into it. If you're watching it at 1030 on Sunday morning, or if you've come back and watched it after the fact, we certainly appreciate you joining us. I know that it's different. It's not like being in person, but I do hope that you will join your, your heart and your mind together with your brothers and sisters who are focusing on the Lord today as we worship. Let's begin with a word of prayer, but first we will read from the Psalms. I want to read to you from Psalm 34 as an invitation into worship this morning. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Let's focus on those words this morning. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Lord, we are thankful that we have the opportunity and the ability to meet in this way today. Though it is not just what we are used to, you are still able to meet with us and speak to us. So may our hearts today be drawn near to you as we once again focus on your love for us and our love to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to join our voices and hearts together in singing a couple of songs here, here at the beginning of our uh, worship service. So join together, won't you, as we sing praises to the Lord. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And I wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean Singing how shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me for me it was in God, He prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no 
wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me Amen. Thank you for participating in that aspect of worship this morning. A couple of brief reminders for you. Again, just you know, as we have been now said for uh, almost every Sunday for uh, a couple of years almost, that our giving can be done online. If you are wanting to give to the mission and ministry of the church, it is so important for what we are doing and endeavoring to do in our community. <clears throat> we encourage you to do that. HudsonWesleyan.org slash give or by sending your gifts 
uh, into the church via mail or when you are here in the church building. Our uh, calendar for the month of March uh, will be coming out uh, next week is the plan. So they are, we're already looking at what's, what's going to be happening in March. So you can be looking forward to that. Uh, we mentioned last Sunday that the weekly Bible devotional plans were taking a three-week break from those and this little in-between time between the two uh, sermon series that we are engaging in, the one we finished up on the gospel in the flesh, the one we're going to be doing on uh, the gospel in selflessness. And so you can be looking forward to that. Lent season is coming soon upon us. We'll have a couple of announcements about that next Sunday as well. Uh, but those devotional uh, plans for the week, we will be starting back up uh, in March, I believe. So you can be looking forward to that. We want to continue to uh, remind folks as well that we are uh, doing uh, Children's Church on Sunday morning. Obviously, with us being virtual today, we don't have a, a children's service, but we are doing those on Sunday mornings. So kids uh, come into church and, and participate in the, in the large service and then have something specifically for your age as well. Other announcements can always be found on our Facebook page. We try to uh, send texts and phone call updates out about those as well. But just wanted to uh, remind you about those couple of things today. We are going to uh, spend some time in prayer in a few minutes. But for our uh, scripture uh, reading this morning, I thought that we might do something a little unique with us being virtual today and uh, listen or watch and read and reflect on um, a scripture video that has been put together specifically for us to spend time in meditation on the word. And so this video from Psalm 1, a great um, reminder of the majesty of God and his goodness. For our scripture reading this morning, let's reflect and, and pray and, and read these words together as they are on the screen. And then we will go into a season of prayer together.
during our prayer time this morning, we certainly want to continue to pray for all of those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Again, with this past week and, and David's funeral, that was a, another fresh reminder to us of uh, the pain of loss. And so we want to be praying for all those who are experiencing that right now. We want to pray for our church and our community. Usually we're gathering on Sunday nights for prayer. Obviously we won't be doing that tonight with uh, us being virtual this weekend, but we want to pray for uh, for our church, for our community, for people who don't, have a, who don't have a transforming relationship with Jesus. We want to be in prayer for those who are sick, for those who are seeking guidance, for those who are dealing with maybe unexpected difficulties in their life, and pray that the Lord will be opening doors and avenues for us to share his love with those around us. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Jesus, we are so thankful for your goodness to us, your love, your grace that we have been focusing on in these services. And Lord, we are thankful for your ability and understanding that is far outside of our own. You are greater than we are. God, we say that sometimes and maybe it just comes off and we just sort of say it and don't think much about it, but, but it is so good to know that you are more than us, that you, are, that you are beyond us. God, as we gather our hearts together this morning, we recognize that there are people in pain and people who are hurting and people who are suffering and sorrowing and loss is real and hurt is real and brokenness is real. God, you know all about the needs of our church and our community. You know all the needs represented by every person that's part of this congregation. Lord, I pray that today you will be near to those who are brokenhearted, that you'll bring comfort to the sorrowing, that you'll bring guidance to those who seek wisdom, that you'll bring healing to the sick. Lord, I pray today that you will be with those who are struggling, maybe in a workplace situation or a relationship problem, we pray that you will um, provide not just the wisdom, but the, but the grace that goes and is needed in difficult situations. Lord, for our community, for those who don't know you, we pray that you will move and that you will speak to them. Lord, help us to be agents of your grace. Help us to show your love. May people get a glimpse of you in our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, before we look into the word together, let's join our hearts and voices together in singing again, and then we will open the scriptures.
Well, last week at uh, Hudson Wesleyan, we had uh, mentioned that we were going to do a little three-week interlude between these two larger sermon series that we uh, were focusing on, and we were going to be talking about love. Last week, we talked about the love that God has for us, uh, how great is the love that the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Next week, we're going to be focusing on our love for others, but today we're going to be talking about our love for God, returning our love to God. Remember that we would have no idea what love really was, true, pure love, if we didn't have the example of Jesus showing it to us in the Gospels and in the New Testament. And so when we talk about living out love on our own or in our lives, we first have to talk about that love relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we're going to focus on that today. I'm going to invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 2. We're actually going to look at a couple of different passages of Scripture this morning, but we're going to start off in Revelation chapter 2. And as you are turning there, if you so desire, just a little bit of background. So the book of Revelation is written by John. Of course, we also uh, heard from John last week in his first epistle. Uh, the book of Revelation written by John, it was a vision given to John. Um, a lot of people think about it in terms of the end times, and there is prophecy there. But there's also a lot, uh, the main focus, a lot of focus on uh, Jesus' uh, relationship with his church and what that looks like into eternity or with eternal implications. And so that is what we're going to be focusing on here this morning. And so at the beginning of Revelation, there's actually these letters to different churches that uh, that John is, is scribing, if you will, for Jesus Christ from his vision. And so we're going to start by looking at Revelation chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. To the angel of the church at Ephesus, or in Ephesus, right, so this is the Ephesian church. This is the Spirit of God talking. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, referencing Jesus. This is what Jesus has to say. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance. Good things. You work hard. You persevere. And you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles when they are not, or and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. So all of these good things that Jesus has to say about the church of Ephesus. You work hard. You persevere. You test uh, the preachers or those who claim my name to see whether or not what they are preaching and teaching really lines up with who I am. You persevered for my name's sake and you don't grow weary. Wow. Any church that should, could have all those things said about it is impressive. But, he says in verse 4, I have this against you. Or some translations, I believe, say this one thing against you. That you have left your first love. For all of the good things that he says about the church of Ephesus, he says there's one thing that bothers me here. You've left your first love. You're doing all this work and you're, you're testing to see if teaching lines up with, with what you know about me. You're persevering. But you're not in love with me anymore. My friends, last week when we talked about God's love for us, powerful, that's the beginning of everything. And we often want to think about how we then love those around us. And as I said, we're going to be talking about that. But how important is it for us to continually live out love for Jesus? Sometimes in a love relationship, a romantic relationship, a family relationship, even a friendship, we think of loving the other person uh, as uh, doing something that is meaningful to them. We, we, we show them love because we know that they appreciate it. Or maybe even that they need us to show it to them. Jesus is no such person. He doesn't need us to love him. He doesn't need us to show him how, uh, how much we are dedicated to him. His Existence is not dependent upon us proving our love to him. 
What he has to say here in the book of Revelation is that what it bothers him or what he has against them is that they are abandoning that passionate love for him. Not because it makes him step back and say, oh, I'm not getting what I need from these people, but because he knows that that love is the only thing that is going to make an eternal difference for this church and for the people who are part of the church. My friends, we can do all the things right, but have we loved Jesus more than anything? Have we loved Jesus more than everything? You remember the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and wants to know about the commandments and about following after God. Jesus pins it right down about what the problem is, doesn't he? Really a complete, unequivocal love for God. And so when we are walking in relationship with Jesus, so many times we think of just crossing the line. I need my sins forgiven. I'll ask for forgiveness. There, I've crossed into relationship with Jesus. But forgiveness of sins is not the only component of our relationship with Jesus. Remember, we were created as humanity back in the garden to have this love relationship with God. To fellowship with him. That was lost because of sin. So the forgiveness of sins is really just a restoration of getting us back to that relationship with a holy God. And that is expressed through our love for Jesus. Think about all the things that we spend time and effort on in our lives. We talked last week about because of God's love for us and we are children of God that we should bear the family resemblance. But think about the things that we spend our time and effort and money and resources on. How much of what we do when people look at us and how we live would be categorized as a passionate love for Jesus? It's something to think about, absolutely. I want to take you on then to another passage of scripture from the Gospel of John. We're doing a lot of work with John. We read some of his uh, epistle, which is full of, of discussions about love. We've read some of the uh, prophecy or revelation. Now we're going to go back to John chapter 21. This is his Gospel account from the time that he spent with Jesus when Jesus was on the earth. And so in John chapter 21, and we're going to look at verse 15 through 17. John 21, 15 through 17. I'm sorry, I got the wrong passage there. Um, this is, uh, no, I'm right. I'm right. I'm sorry. I'm just on the wrong page of my Bible. 21, 15 through 17. Jesus has raised from the dead. Jesus has been raised from the dead. And now he is uh, spending time with his disciples. And you remember that he has this interaction at the Sea of Galilee with uh, his disciples. And um, Jesus begins to talk to Peter. Remember, Peter's the one who betrayed Jesus. And so Jesus, he didn't really need to question Peter to find out whether or not Peter loved him. Jesus knows everything. But I believe he was questioning Peter so Peter could think about whether or not Peter truly loved Jesus. It says this, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? We're not exactly sure what the these is referring to. Some people think that it means more than these other people love me, but I don't think that that's probably what Jesus was meaning. As they were at the Sea of Galilee, and this is a place, of course, where um, they had been fishing, and they had actually been fishing that day, I think that Jesus may have been motioning to the, uh, the, the boats and the nets and the lake and the fish and saying, this stuff that is really what has identified you, do you love me more than all of that? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, then tend my lambs. Now in verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so he said to him, shepherd my sheep. 
He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This is verse 17. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. The one who had denied Jesus, now confronted with having to look inside himself and say, do I love Jesus more than anything? Remember, what had caused Peter to deny Jesus the first time? He was afraid. What might happen to us? What might happen to me? And so he says, do you love me? More than everything else, more than anything that you have identified with, do you love me? And Peter says, you know that I do. And then God gives him, Jesus gives him a calling, a work to be done. Friends, think in your own heart right now. Think, you're watching this, it's a virtual service. Look around you and think about the things that you have and the the possessions that you own and the people that you're in relationship with and the, the things that identify you. Ask yourself this question right now. Do I love him more than these? Do I love him? It's a powerful and important question. Now, our natural response is, well, of course I love him. Of course, yes, we love Jesus, absolutely. But Jesus is asking the question for us to really get a grip on what does it mean for us to love him then? And he gives Peter some things to do. There's going to be a task of ministry and the gospel being preached and of people coming to know Jesus. Work in the church and in the world in which we live. So if we love him, if Peter loves him, then there are going to be things that flow out of that. There's going to be behaviors and actions and work to do for the kingdom of God, more important than anything else that we have. So while last week we were saying that internally we're sort of pursuing the family resemblance of purity and holiness and love because we are part of the family of God, his love for us that we have accepted. Today we are saying, if we in turn love him, then all of the things that we do, even for the church, remember the book of Revelation, you've persevered, you've toiled, you've made sure the teaching was correct, you've done all these things, but you are sliding away from your passionate love for me. So all the things we do for the church, and all the things that we possess, and all the things around us, and all the things that we identify with, all of those things are secondary to us loving Jesus, sacrificially. And we're going to be talking about that in our next sermon series, The Gospel and Self-Sacrifice. But sacrificially, selflessly, caught up in Jesus and loving him. It says that Peter was grieved because Jesus asked him again. But I don't think Jesus was trying to hurt Peter's feelings. I think he was really wanting Peter to count the cost. Some people say that Jesus asked Peter three times because Peter had denied him three times. That may be true. But I think he was really wanting Peter to get a grip on, do you love me? Peter was going to have to have that settled in his heart because Peter had... A difficult road ahead of him and of course was eventually murdered for the faith. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to dive even deeper here. If Jesus says that the um, greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God, right? Love the Lord your God with everything that you have. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. What is it that usually stands in the way? Matthew chapter 6, and we will look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters, Jesus says. Part of the Sermon on the Mount here. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. 
or physical things. This comes after him saying about storing up our treasures in heaven, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I want to take a little bit of a deeper dive into this just for a few minutes. Jesus says you can't have two compelling forces vying for the number one spot in your life. You can't serve two masters. You're going to love one and despise the other, or you'll hate one and cling to the other. But it's not going to be both. And what is the thing that he latches on to that is most likely to vie for our love? Wealth. Or money. Or physical goods. He says you can't serve them both. Now, usually when we teach this or preach it, you know, immediately we say, you know, now we're not saying there's anything wrong with wealth. But Jesus has said, be careful. It is next to impossible for a wealthy person to enter into the kingdom. So is wealth sinful? Of course not. Is it a blessing of God? It can be. Is it used for, for his purposes? It should be. But with all the things that we have, again, look around us. Look at what, what we've got. It is so easy for those things to become the number one object of our emotional affection and even our spiritual commitment. We go back to Revelation. You have left your first love. What was it that they had left their first love for? It could have been any number of things. But I suspect that it may be that they were getting their eyes on the things around them, on physical things. No one can serve two masters. See, now wait a minute, serving doesn't sound much like a love relationship. I thought we were supposed to love Jesus. Yes, but in loving him, what are we called to do? We are called to follow him, to obey him, to serve him. Again, not because he can't survive without us, but because that's the relationship he's called us into. Because he's holy and perfect and righteous and we are not. You cannot serve the physical, temporary, what's eventually going to be rotting wealth that we have and serve Jesus wholeheartedly. One of them is going to have to have the number one seat in our life. So when we talk about loving God or being in a love relationship with Jesus, last week his love for us, this week our love for him, let's go back and look at three things then that we have learned from these passages. One, it is possible for our love for God to wane, to slack off, to decrease. We need to be careful about that. That's the first thing. Two, when we love Jesus, it results in us participating in his mission. Peter, do you love me? Yes, then feed my sheep. Shepherd my flock. Take care of my lambs. Okay? So if we keep the fires of love for Jesus burning deeply within us, We will participate in the mission that Jesus is on. Third, there are other things vying for our love. For our attention. The world is full of voices that are calling for our commitment. For our emotional investment. Some are good. Some are bad. Some are benign, but none of them can take the place of Jesus Christ. How do we invest our time? How do we invest our money? How do we invest our abilities? Are we on mission with Jesus? Are we, are we sold out to him? Or are other things really vying for that? Or maybe even we have left our first love and now we are just sort of kind of giving Jesus 
the scraps of maybe an hour on a Sunday morning or a quick read through the passage of Scripture as we dash off to our next thing. We've all been there. I've been there. We struggle with this. I don't want to leave my first love. I don't think you want to leave your first love. But the warning of Scripture is then that we need to dig in and we need to grab fresh hold of and we need to desire and pursue this love relationship with Jesus. He has done all that is needed and we are just invited in to that relationship with him. As I said, next week we're going to talk about our love for other people. But friends, make no mistake about it. Make no mistake. You cannot well love other people if we are not desperately in love with Jesus. Last week, when we were talking about God's love for us, we said, remember, this is not a love that we deserve. But it's one that's extended to us. Which means also all the other people around us, even the ones that we don't like or don't care for or struggle with, they are also recipients of this offer of love. They are also made in the image of God. So next week we're going to talk about what's it look like to love other people. But we will not be able to do that if we do not love Jesus wholeheartedly. Now, as we wind down, you say, so pastor, how do I, how do I get to the point of loving Jesus more? I want that in my heart. I, maybe I've not been doing what I ought to do, or I'm not, I've not been pursuing it the way I ought to pursue it. How do I love Jesus more? Let me give you a couple of suggestions, a couple of ideas of ways we can stoke that fire of love. One, we have to spend time engaging with him. You say, oh yeah, so I need to read my Bible more. Well, yes, you need to be in the Word. But we need to spend time allowing our minds to be saturated in who Jesus is. Quit being conditioned primarily by the world. Oh, it's it's just uh, so common anymore to hear about, you know, like, well, we turn on the TV and we're conditioned by what we see. But the fact of the matter is that people are probably more conditioned and discipled by what they hear and read and watch on news and talk shows and opinions, internet, cable, online resources of like blogs and things like that. Is that what's conditioning our mind about how we should think about the world or is Jesus conditioning our mind? So if you want to get back to your first love, be saturated by him. Second, if we really want to dive deep into love with Jesus. I think we ought to quit assuming, well, there's certain things that Jesus, I mean, he wouldn't really want us to do that. He wouldn't really mean go that far. He wouldn't be that extreme. I think Jesus is much more extreme than we give him credit for when it comes to what it looks like to love. Quit putting him in a box. The third and final one I would say is rest in him. Jesus is not there to tick off every little thing that you've got wrong, but that's also not licensed to just slip into laziness spiritually. Rest in him, that he loves you, and he's inviting you to love him and to have this ongoing relationship where he will show us the path of truth and righteousness and holiness. So this week, be saturated by Jesus. Don't try to put him in a box about, about what or limit him on what he may be calling you to do in participation of his mission like he gave to Peter. And third, rest in him. Rest in him. Know that he loves you and has an eternal plan for you. As we get ready to close this morning, we're going to sing together one more time. And focus our hearts in on the love of of God and our response. Let's join together.
experienced your love, we will return to you our own hearts full of love, every part of ourselves, and that this week we will be saturated with who you are and live that out in the world around us. Bless us with your grace and peace, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you, my friends. Have a wonderful week in the presence of our Lord.